I hereby open the commencement exercises of St. Vladimir's Theological Seminary for the mid-year commencement 222-223. You may be seated. I'm Brother Chad Hatfield, the president of St. Vladimir Seminary, and I want to welcome all of you who are here in the Metropolitan Philip Auditorium this evening and the multitude who are listening via the virtual world. That's one of the things that has turned into a blessing this side of the COVID pandemic. We also have several guests who are with us this evening. I'd like to introduce them. The convocation was opened by His Eminence Archbishop Daniel, Archbishop of Chicago, and the OCA Diocese of the Midwest. It is a distinguished pleasure to have with us this evening Metropolitan Antonios, who is the Patriarchal Vicar for Patriarch John the Tenth of Antioch. We also have a member of our Board of Trustees, uh, Archimandrite Jeremy Davis, uh, who is the Protosingulus of the Antiochian Archdiocese, Assistant to the Metropolitan. Archpriest John Parker is with us this evening. Father John, of course, is the Dean of our sister seminary, St. Tikhon's in South Canaan, Pennsylvania. And also amongst our guests this evening is Father Alexander Caranda, the Dean of Holy Trinity Cathedral in the Diocese of Chicago. Linda Borsma is with us as well, the wife of Hans Borsma, whom I'm now honored to introduce. I want to begin this introduction by saying that our speaker this evening is yet another thread in a long line of historical exchanges and cooperation that runs through the history of both St. Vladimir's Seminary and the Shota House, where since 2019, the Reverend Dr. Hans Burzma is the chair of the Order of St. Benedict Servants of Christ Endowed Professorship of Ascetical Theology. Historical work with the Fellowship of Saints Alban and Sergius will find contributions from great names and figures from both seminaries. Anglican financial support for our seminary was very strong in the early days. That includes financial support for the future Patriarch Paulos of Ethiopia, who graduated from our seminary in the early 1960s. St. Vladimir Seminary and Neshota House have hosted conferences with the fellowship over the years, and in 2009, a concordant was signed noting this history and looking to the future for additional mutual exchanges and learning. Professors from both seminaries have been part of an honest and often very hard theological presentation that as noted has a long history. Once again, as with many of our previous presenters of the Schmemann lecture, we will hear from a professor of aesthetical theology who has become well, what can be called a person of interest in several Christian traditions, including our own Orthodox world. A priest in the Anglican Church in North America. By the way, I co-chair the OCA ACNA Dialogue. He holds a Bachelor of Education from the Christian Pedag Pedagogical Academy in the Netherlands, a Bachelor of Arts in History earned at Lethbridge University, his Master of Divinity degree from the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary in Hamilton, Ontario, the THM in Historical Theology, University of Utrecht, and the PhD in Historical Theology from the same university. I was looking over articles that he has written, and they are way too numerous to be listed here, but I would encourage you to do some exploration on your own. He's the author of at least 16 books with titles such as Eucharistic Participation, The Reconfiguration of Time and Space, Scripture as Real Presence, Seeing God, The Beatific Vision in Christian Tradition, and Five Things Theologians Wish Biblical Scholars Knew. 
If this last one catches your attention, then I urge you to check out Professor Hunt's podcast world. I know that you are anxious to hear from Dr. Burzma, and now I invite you to the podium to offer the 40th annual Father Alexander Schmemann Memorial Lecture. Professor Burzma. Thank you so much, Father Chad, for those very kind, welcoming words. It is a great privilege to be with you this evening on this feast day of the three hierarchs, and an honor and joy to present the Father Alexander Schmemann Memorial Lecture. Very aware of the long and deep bonds that you've mentioned already, Father Chad, between St. Vladimir's and the Shota House. At the house, we keep you in our daily prayers, in our liturgy. It is therefore such a joy, finally, to be able to visit you here in person. I want to thank you, especially Father Chad Hatfield, probably the most distinguished of our Neshota House graduates, and also you, Dean Alex Tadori, for your very kind invitation and warm hospitality that you've extended to my wife and me. It has been a real joy being with you both, as well as with the other faculty these last couple of days. Thank you. Does God have a body? The very idea may seem preposterous. God is not an animal, whether rational or irrational. The higher up we move on the chain of being, the more ethereal its occupants. Even if, as many in the tradition have maintained, angels too have bodies, it would still seem axiomatic to say that God does not. He is spiritual, infinite, invisible, perfections that appear at odds with an embodied God. Problematic implications of divine embodiment seem obvious. It either makes God human, anthropomorphism, or it confuses him with the cosmos, pantheism. The Christian God may not have a body the way that Zeus had a body, but could the entire cosmos be the body of God? Such a claim too would seem intolerable. Does it not veer dangerously close to confusing creator and creature? Pantheism has always been considered incompatible with the Christian faith, for it destroys the transcendence of God and ends up justifying whatever exists, whether good or evil, as divine. Pantheizing God is no less troubling than anthropomorphizing or mythologizing him. Yet, Christianity is not Gnostic. God assumes a body in Jesus Christ. The Chalcedonian definition serves as the benchmark for an orthodox understanding of the two natures of Christ as unconfused, asynchutos, unchangeable, atreptos, indivisible, adiairatos, and inseparable, achoristos, in the one person of the logos or word of God. The incarnation tells us that the eternal word has taken upon himself a human nature, body and soul. We most truly know God in and through his condescension in the humanity of Christ. And we best understand man through his deifying union with God in Christ. God is known in man, for man is known in God. God is embodied, at least in Jesus Christ. What I hope to make clear in this lecture is that Chalcedonian Christology 
teaches us something also about God's general way of doing things. Whenever and wherever he manifests himself, God's typical paradigmatic way of acting is Chalcedonian in character. Chalcedon, therefore, has something to say not just about the incarnation, but also about creation. As a theophany of God, creation echoes and shares in the truth of Chalcedon. St. Maximus the Confessor famously ponders the link between incarnation and creation in Ambiguum 722. The Logos of God, who is God, wills always and in all things to accomplish the mystery of his embodiment. Note that Maximus uses the language of embodiment and somatosis. This statement, which has been the topic of much scholarly discussion, is worth reflecting on in some detail. Maximus's remark is hardly an isolated standalone maxim. We should explore the larger context of Ambiguum 7, in which he comes to grips with a statement from St. Gregory of Nazianzus, one of the three hierarchs in commemoration of whom we are together this evening. Gregory in his oration on love for the poor had referred to the human person as a portion of God, which had slipped down from above. So that as he puts it, in our struggle and battle with the body, we should always look to God. I'll spare you the details, both of Nazianzen's oration and of Maximus's interpretation of it. But I'll make an exception for the remarkable expression, portion of God, Moiratha'u and the suggestion of man slipping down, riomai, from above. Maximus takes the phrase portion of God quite seriously. He insists on using this language to denote the logos or rational principle of each one of us pre-existing in God. When we act in line with this eternal logos of ours, we move up toward God. Maximus's logoi are closely connected to Platonic ideas and historically speaking, ultimately derived from them. Though for Maximus, they function in a somewhat different manner than they did for Plato. Every creature for Maximus has his own distinct logos, as does each species and genus. Logoi, our God has eternally in mind for his creatures, the principles that arrange the essences and ordering of all created beings. Altogether, these logoi are held together in the one logos of God, as the wisdom of God, arranging the order and character of the cosmos. As such, the logoi are both God's thoughts and his wills with respect to the creature. The principles, therefore, that establish the nature or essence of a creature. Maximus borrows here from the sixth century Syrian monk Dionysius, whom he quotes in Ambiguum 7, and who had referred to these logoi as God's predeterminations or wills for creatures. God then has these predeterminations or wills for the entire created order and every creature within it. Maximus, however, was more dynamic in his approach than the Neoplatonic tradition preceding him, more dynamic even than Dionysius. God's logoi, logoi concern not only the natures of individuals, their species and genera, but also the way they live, and where they end up eschatologically. Maximus famously distinguishes for each creature a logos of being, ani, well-being, uani, and of eternal well-being, ia, uani. Each of these three aspects assumes that we are a portion of God. Maximus explains in the same ambiguum seven that we are a portion of God because we owe our being, our existence to God. We're a portion of God also because we owe our well-being to him. 
And finally, we are a portion of God because we owe our eternal well-being or divinization to him. In short, we are portions of God in terms of creation, goodness, and divinization. Every aspect of our lives is encapsulated in God, a portion of God, because God has a logos or eternal principle for every stage of our lives from beginning to end. The aim of eternal well-being entails for Maximus that through humanity, the creator may come to reside in all beings so that the many will be drawn together into the one, into one rather, with God encompassing all things and hypostasizing them in him. Or as Nicholas Constance translates, making them subsist in himself. As a result, says Maximus, God will be all in all. When we lead a virtuous life, we live in line with our logos of well-being, which Maximus also calls the logos of virtue. The very essence of, see, of every virtue is God or Jesus Christ. Maximus insists, therefore, that anyone who through fixed habit participates, metechon, in virtue, unquestionably participates, again, meteche, in God. Who is, the, who is the substance, the usia, of the virtues. For Maximus, the one logos, or word of God, is the many logoi of the creatures. The many logoi are altogether the one logos of God. Maximus appears to suggest, therefore, that when we live in line with our logos, we participate in the logos of God, the one who is virtue or goodness itself. We are portions of God by living in line with God's logos for us, which is simply another way of, of talking about participation in God. Whenever we do not live according to our logos of virtue, instead of moving up to God in divinization, we slip down, diomai, away from God, into nothingness. Maximus thus interprets the great hierarch Nazianzen as cautioning us that it matters profoundly how, as portions of God, we treat the instability and transience of earthly things and how we respond to the misery that we go through in life, lest we slip away from God into nothingness. It's not as though Maximus reluctantly use the language of men as portions of God, merely compelled by Gregory the theologian's use of the term. The expression fits squarely with Maximus's own overall understanding of the creator creature relationship. Elsewhere, he adopts from Gregory's oration on the nativity, the expression of the logos becoming thick. Maximus interprets this term as referring to any one of three things. The Logos's manifestation in the flesh, that through words and examples, he might teach us mysteries that transcend human speech. Second, the Logos ineffably concealing himself in the Logoi of beings while being obliquely signified in visible things as if through certain letters. And finally, the logos being embodied letters, syllabus, syllables, sounds. The language of embodying or thickening indicates that the logos makes himself present, whether in Jesus, in creation, or in scripture. We should not be surprised, therefore, to hear Maximus talk about God interpenetrating with those who are worthy, or suggest that God will be contained uncontainably in the saints, or express hope that all created things will be enveloped in God's presence, or quote Nazianzen as saying that our intellect and reason will mingle with its archetypal kin. 
All this underlines that for Maximus, it was inconceivable to think of creation as separate from the creator. Maximus's Logos framework tells us that his approach is thoroughly Christological. The eternal Logos embodying himself in the flesh, creation, and scripture. Maximus's metaphysic is therefore theological, even Christological, not some abstract philosophical framework imposed from the outside. Professor similarly obtains to ground his claim that we are portions of God in the divine scriptures. He quotes at length the passages of Ephesians 1, 17 through 23 and 4, 11 through 15, where the apostle speaks of the saints as members, melee, of the body of Christ. Maximus zeroes in on the similarity between Nazianzen's term portion, Moira, and St. Paul's language of member, melos. In Gregory's passage under discussion, writes Maximus, the word portion and the word member are the same. For if a member is a part of the body and a part is the same as a portion, the member and portion are one and the same thing. Maximus maps Nazianzen's language of being us being portions of God directly onto the Pauline discourse of us being members of the body of Christ. Since Maximus makes Christology central to the creator-creature relationship, it is hardly surprising that he employs also Chalcedonian vocabulary. It's not just the human and divine natures of Christ that are unconfused, unchangeable, indivisible, and inseparable. So are creator and creature. And so are the eternal word and biblical words. As I think Jordan Wood has recently made indisputably clear. In each case, according to Maximus, does the Logos hypostatically embody himself in creaturely form. Maximus is particularly clear about this, his Chalcedonian reading of the creator-creature relationship in his lovely book on the ecclesiastical mystagogy. I take the entire treatise to be an exposition of symbology centered upon the church. It is a symbology shaped by the logic of Chalcedon. When in the first chapter, Maximus compares the church's work to that of God, he explains that God's power of goodness is like the center of a circle you have that in, in a handout that I've asked to be distributed so you can look up the picture on the handout. The circles radii, the principles or logoi of beings, move like straight lines toward the edge without being able to move beyond it. The outer limit provides created things with stability and protects them from non-being from separation from God. The church, which symbolizes God as its archetype, creates the same unity, writes Maximus, even if they, are different, if they are different in their characteristics and from different places and have different customs, those who are present in the church are made one according to the same oneness through faith. God himself works in the ghetto. God himself works this oneness by nature without confusion, asunjutos, around the substances of the things that are alleviating and making identical that which is different around them by reference to and oneness with himself as their cause and beginning and end as it has been demonstrated. God's energy affects the same unity among the church members that he also affects in the logoi around himself, so that the believers are united without confusion. By using this key Chalcedonian idiom, Maximus appears to be hinting that the unity of believers that God creates in and through the church is grounded 
in the unconfused unity of the one person of Christ. The confessor again uses Chalcedonian language when in the next chapter, he discusses how the church's own unity of sanctuary and nave symbolizes the unity of the universe, the intelligible and sensible realms. He claims is one hypostasis consisting of two realms. The universe, suggests Maximus, is similarly ingeniously interwoven. It is one, which is to say undivided, the aeroton, yet asumchutos, without confusion. Maximus piles on the Chalcedonian language in describing the unity of the church, the cosmos. Chalcedon functions as the hermeneutical key to the symbolic relations that only ecclesiastical mystagogy examines, whether it's relations in the ecclesial, the cosmic, the anthropological, or the hermeneutical realm. So far, I've tried to show that Maximus grounds his metaphysic Christologically and biblically. The Logos embodies himself in a variety of ways so that we are portions or members of Christ. This does not, however, preclude the impact of Neoplatonism with its notion of participation in the divine. Maximus draws extensively on Proclus to explain the participatory relationship between the Logos, his eternal energies, and created things. Maximus does so throughout his writings, including in Ambiguum 7, which we've already looked at. Now, Proclus, as you can see on the second image on your handout, Proclus had posited a threefold hierarchical schema of unparticipated amethecton, participated metachomena, and participants, metachontes. Proposition 23 of his Elements of Theology, the fifth century Neoplatonist philosopher, deals with the problem of the one and the many. The unparticipated monad produces, he says, out of itself, after out to, the participated hypostases, the realm of divine henads. The monad, therefore, is not sterile or isolated, but instead, he says, gives something of itself, again, of her outer, namely the next level of the participated. And he passes this on also to the participants at the third level. The participated apostasies at the intermediate level pass on the illumination from above by implanting a potency in things. Is Proclus, all that is participated without loss of separateness is present to the participant through an inseparable potency which it implants. For Proclus, because the participated are separate from the participants, they must convey to the participants some kind of potency, dunamis, some kind of enlightenment, elumpsis, as a link between the two. The similarity between Proclus and Maximus is striking. Both have a threefold schema of unparticipated, participated, and participating. Proclus's treatment of the three levels is similar to Maximus' Maximus's circle with its center, radii, and boundary. The relationship between the three levels functions in similar ways in Proclus and Maximus. For Maximus, God, and hence ultimately also the Logos is beyond being unparticipated, much like the Proclean one. For Maximus, creatures participate in the intermediate level of being itself, immortality itself, life itself, holiness itself, virtue itself, goodness itself. By participating in being itself or immortality itself, etc. Created temporal beings participate in the being of God. Maximus explains that the distinction between participated transcendentals, being itself, goodness itself, etc., and participating things 
beings, good things, plural. So this distinction maps onto two biblical texts, which seem to contradict each other. And you have an outline of those two texts in your third um, image on the outline. John 5, 17, where Jesus says that God, as well as he himself, is working until now. And then Genesis 2, 3, where Moses comments that God rested on the seventh day from all his works that he began to do. We, should we could sketch Maximus's exegesis of these two verses in the following way. According to Maximus, John 5 re refers to God's ever-continuing works. That is to say, his participated transcendental categories, such as being itself, immortality itself, and the like. They're uncreated, divine activities that come from God's essence, and so are called things around God. Works of God that are eternal, without a beginning. Genesis 2 speaks of God resting from a different kind of work, namely that of creating particular, participating beings or objects. God has created these sensible things ex nihilo. They are the result of natural activities and energeiae of God that he directs to the outside, ad extra. Temporal works, in other words, that God began to do. Maximus reconciles John 5 and Genesis 2 by arguing that Jesus had in mind transcendental participated being itself, while Moses spoke of particular participating beings. Maximus then combines Chalcedon and Proclus. A Christological account of, of hypostatic union with a philosophical exposition of participation. Or as Thorstein Tollefson might put it, on the one hand, the creation of the creature ex nihilo, according to its logos of being, establishing the creature's nature or essence. And on the other hand, the creature's participation in divine being, according to its tropos, establishing the creature's mode of being, its moral fitness. It's tempting, perhaps, to force a choice between these two accounts. I don't think Maximus worked with such a dilemma, and we should not either. Maximus embraced a Christian Platonist metaphysic, convinced that the Christian and the Platonist elements, in this regard at least, seamlessly fit together. My suggestion is that for Maximus, Christology requires participation. Chalcedon and Proclus belong together. The reason is straightforwardly this. The incarnation of Christ is the completion of a process of creation that develops through an ever-deepening participation of the Lagos. Maximus following Irenaeus held to an incarnation anyway position. That is to say, the incarnation is not only a response to sin, but is primarily the completion of the process by which God draws the creaturely world perfectly, that is, fully divinized into himself in Jesus Christ. Maximus famously claims that the incarnation is the blessed end for which all things were brought into existence. The preconceived goal, he says, for the sake of which everything exists. Theologically, the Christ event precedes the creation of the world, even if chronologically creation precedes the incarnation. For Maximus, the incarnation, therefore, was not an afterthought. All of this suggests to me that Jordan Wood is correct in his claim that the incarnational language that describes creation is not just metaphorical, Creation itself is the beginning of incarnation in Maximus' thought. Yet, the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ is not strictly identical 
to the hypostatic union of creation or of the church. As we've already seen, theologically, the archetype, the incarnation of the logos in Christ, precedes the types. The embodiments of the logos in creation, in scripture, in church. The union of the logos with the human nature of Christ is the archetype upon which every preceding and every subsequent embodiment of the logos is patterned. What is more, the archetypal hypostatic union of the logos in Christ is qualitatively different from every other embodiment and hence is unique and unrepeatable. And here I take um, a slightly different uh, approach than Jordan Wood does in his recent book. The reason is that only in the archetypal incarnation at the center of history do we witness perfect deification, participation, or sacramentality. Christ, we might say, is the Ur sacrament, the archetypal sacrament, because the incarnate logos, though tempted in every respect as we are, remained without sin. Only the symbolic participation of Christ's human nature in the logos makes for perfect deification. Or we might also say only in the incarnation of Christ is the logos of well-being fully in sync with the logos of being. Every other embodiment of the logos is limited, efficient. The journey of human beings depends in terms of goodness or virtue upon the shape that our tropos or mode, sorry, upon the shape that the tropos or mode of their logos of being takes in their lives. And hence it depends upon the degree of their participation in the logos of God. No matter the progress of the journey, no one, either prior to or after the incarnation of Christ, has attained the kind of perfection embodied in him. Much depends upon the new divine tropos, or mode, which is meant to shape the deification of man. To be sure, human nature ever remains what it is. The logoi unchangeably are what they are, for they are simply God's eternal determinations of our creaturely being. Logos speaks of nature. Tropos refers to the person. For Maximus, natures, whether human or divine, do not change. The change in a person's life, therefore, is a change not in his logos, but in his tropos, which is to say, in the actual shape he gives to his life, morally speaking. Jean-Claude Lachier rightly explains that it is the tropos or mode of the logos of being that changes in line with the logos of well-being. Human nature remains human, even in deification. The union is personal, hypostatic, not natural. In no way, therefore, does Maximus confuse God's nature with man's. Maximus may speak of divine embodiment in creation, but this emphatically does not make him a pantheist. Maximus insists that every one of the renewals of the tropos occurs on account of and through the utterly and truly new mystery of the incarnation. Born as a perfect man, anthropos teleos, without corruption, God renewed nature with respect to its mode. In other words, it is the incarnation, the perfect humanity of Christ that enables the renewal of our tropos. Well-being for Maximus has to do with goodness and wisdom, and as such with the tropos or mode of our being. This well-being is joined back together with being when Christ's incarnation and baptism renew our tropos, the word being good and humane 
submitted himself both to a natural birth without sin and to a spiritual birth of adoption and baptism. Thereby, says Maximus, abolishing our bodily birth and restoring our birth in the spirit. The renewal of our tropos heals the divide between being and well-being. Maximus does claim, I think, that all of creation is hypostatically structured, that it exists as an embodiment of God. But it is an embodiment that looks forward to the fullness of Christ. Every embodiment preceding and following Christ is an imperfect and therefore merely analogous participation in the logos. Participation is proportionate on the logos to its capacity, which depends upon the kind of creature it is. And in the case of man, it's moral fitness. Maximus's language of creation as hypostatic union is not mere metaphor. It is, however, analogous discourse. Creation is, as Balthazar and others have claimed, analogically related to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It is no doubt true that for Maximus, the Logos hypostatically embodies himself throughout creation. For the Logos of God wills always and in all things to, to accomplish the mystery of his embodiment. But it is also the case that the embodiment of the Logos in the fullness of time in our Lord Jesus Christ is the archetypal source of every other embodiment and of the joining together of being and well-being in the process of deification. It is for that reason, most emphatically not the case that each and every personal union that the Logos embarks upon attains to the same fullness of perfection. For Maximus, such fullness has entered the world only once in Christ, and it is his archetypal fullness at which creation aims through the renewal of its tropos in the growth of its participation in the Logos by way of being, well-being, and eternal well-being. For Maximus, and I agree with him here, the Logos truly embodies himself hypostatically throughout creation. The sacramental real presence of Christ in creation demands no less. At the same time, all such embodiments are mere analogs. Their participation is derivative from, inferior to, and dependent upon the glory of the one who bears the very stamp of God's nature. The hypostatic union of creation relates to the hypostatic union of Christ by way of analogy rather than by strict identity. Both are embodiments of God, but creation's analogous or typical participation in the Logos by way of an imperfect tropos stems from Christ's human nature's original or archetypal participation. Creation embodies God because it, like the incarnation of Christ, is a manifestation of God, a theophany. The embodiment of God in Christ does not preclude his embodiment in creation. Indeed, I think God's embodiment in Christ entails his embodiment also in creation. Why? The relationship between the two is typological or figurative in character. Just as the wilderness rock is a type of Christ and the bronze serpent a figure of the crucifixion, so too creation is a type of the incarnation of Christ. In each case, the type as sacramentum has the function of showing forth in a figurative manner the truth or race that it already embodies. Types 
always already aim at their climactic truth. Their gears are called into being for the sake of their fulfillment, as Maximus keenly realized. God does not act aimlessly or randomly when he creates the cosmos. From the outset, his aim with creation is nothing less than a perfectly divinized man, truly and fully united with God. Sacramental types or figures, rocks, serpents, or creation as a whole, are like their ultimate truth in Christ because they are patterned upon it. The climactic sacramental truth or reality is the archetype, the original exemplar that grounds the types. In God's design, Christ precedes the rock, the cross calls forth a serpent of bronze, and the incarnation grounds creation. The incarnation in the fullness of time is the original archetypal truth of the creator creature relationship. Then we should expect each of its types analogously to echo, to echo it and to participate in it. Just as the echo of a voice depends upon the original utterance, so God's embodiment of creation depends upon his embodiment in Christ. God flings the original archetypal or exemplary truth of Christ throughout the cosmos, in time and in space. So that everything that has being reminds us of Chalcedonian truth. Humanizing of God in the incarnation reverberates like an echo in the humanizing of God in creation. Through this downward movement of God in his embodiment begins historically in creation. But ontologically, it originates in the incarnation. Chalcedon therefore speaks truth, not just about the incarnation of the Son of God, but also about every one of God's actions that precedes or follows it. They all embody the truth of the creator God. God embodies himself, first in Christ, then in all of creation. Just as the downward or humanizing movement of God, the exitus from God, is typologically structured. So too, the upward or deifying movement of man, the reditus to God, is typologically structured. Also in the Eucharist and in the church, does Christ's embodiment in the incarnation echo or reverberate? We are saved through figurative or typological means that are patterned upon the incarnation. There is more than a mere verbal similarity between the historical body of Christ on the one hand and the body of Christ in Eucharist and in church on the other hand. There is an ontological identity between the three bodies, though they are related analogously through varying modes of participation. As Henri de Lubac points out in his seminal work Corpus Mysticum, Christ's historical body, Eucharistic body, and ecclesial body are not actually three separate bodies. They're one threefold body. Why? Because the three are typologically linked. In all three, Maximus might say, the Laga seeks to accomplish the mystery of his embodiment. Redemption is the deifying return of the body of Christ and thus of all creation as church, maturing into the fullness of the one who fills all in all. See, Maximus's language of embodiment and somatosis may be startling. And we do well to be cautious. The dangers of anthropomorphizing, mythologizing, pantheizing God are not illusory. One could easily use the language of divine embodiment as an excuse to drag God down by reducing him to the world of becoming, as if God worked out his identity slowly but surely over time. Such an approach meshes God with the world in a deeply problematic manner. For by simply identifying God with this worldly processes of becoming, 
one loses sight of his otherness or transcendence in relation to the cosmos. By refusing to bow before the God beyond time and space, Hegelian philosophy and process theology end up with a purely this worldly or imminent deity, hardly the sovereign God of St. Maximus and the Christian tradition. How can we appropriate the Maximian language of divine embodiment without diminishing or belittling God? The term embodiment itself gives us the key. I began this lecture with a question, does God have a body? Maximus never calls creation the body of God. That term, though perhaps not problematic per se, may well give the impression that God is like us, one being among many. Just like we have bodies, so God has a body. But God does not have a body the same way we have a body. So God chooses embodiment. It is an embodiment in which, as Chalcedon teaches, the transcendent God remains transcendent, unconfused, asunhutos, the created being in his union with it. Though embodiment is a noun, it speaks of action. God does something, namely embody himself, not under obligation. He is free to do so. He does not have a body by way of necessity imposed upon him. God longs to be embodied and chooses to be embodied. Embodiment is an act undertaken by a transcendent God, utterly beyond the changes and vicissitudes of this worldly beings, the unparticipated Lagos freely assumes man in Christ and freely embodies himself in creation. Indeed, it is only because God is transcendent that he also becomes imminent in creation. Or to use Maximian language, because God is beyond being, huperusios, he can embody himself in Christ and creation. Modernity's disenchantment has banned any thought of God as embodied. The Maximian antidote to modernity's vapid materialism is the recognition that every bit of creation, in every bit of creation, we witness an echo of God's incarnation in Christ. No, Maximus does not take us down the road to pantheism. He does not treat creator and creature as one and the same. He adopts instead a kind of panentheism for everything that exists as its being within, being of God. A God who remains utterly transcendent, while at the same time embodying himself in the cosmos that he fittingly but freely has made. The embodiment of God, therefore, means an enchanted world. For as Maximus already knew, the transcendent creator embodies himself within creation. Modern separation between heaven and earth is responsible for the dehumanization of man and the desacralization of nature. Modernity's disenchantment is reflected in today's widespread reluctance to acknowledge that God is embodied, and that both the exitus, creation, and the reditus, redemption, depend upon this divine embodiment. To become modern means to inhabit a disenchanted, disembodied, and ultimately Gnostic universe. Beauty of Maximian language, God embodying himself, both in Christ and in creation, is that it reminds us that creation comes from him and returns to him. Creation is not a machine. It doesn't have being from itself. It is not autonomous. 
Nothing God makes is just stuff. All of creation is made through hypostatic union with God. Chalcedonian Christi Christianity, the shared inheritance of all Orthodox Christianity, teaches the embodiment of God in Christ as the pattern of the cosmos. The incarnation of Christ reveals the world as theophanic sight, suffused with the presence of God. Thank you, Dr. Borzma. We have time for a few questions, so make your questions sort of concise. You know, don't deliver a second lecture. Uh, come to the microphone in the center and queue up, and that way we'll be able to manage the questions a little quicker. So if you'd like to come to the microphone, we'll open for some Q&A. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Bosma, for your, your lecture. I had a quick question about the term methexis. How hesitant are the fathers outside of Maximus? I know this is unfair because it's beyond the scope of your paper, but I'm very curious if you know. I know, uh, you know the term is important philosophically. Do the Eastern fathers tend to prefer theosis to methexis, or are, are they interchangeable? And where do we see that kind of come into play? Yeah, um, it's a great question and fl uh, flows naturally from what I've what I've presented on Maximus. Um, I don't think Maximus was original on this score in trying to combine Chalcedonian and say Proclean or at least Neoplatonic philosophy. Um, you see much the same thing in St. Gregory of Nyssa. Um, the Chalcedonian logic may not be as pronounced in Dionysius as it is in Maximus, but also there, I think you see both. In, in Gregory of Nyssa in particular, from whom Maximus borrows a great deal, uh, both are emphatically present. So no, I don't think it's unique to Maximus at all. I wanna thank you for using the term henads in a lecture such as this. My question is about the reception of Proclus and that is there any difference between the way Dionysius receives Proclus and the way Maximus receives Proclus, particularly on participation in the Henad? So for example, Dionysius says, he, he makes up this word, ta amethectos, right? Ta amethectos metehomena, unparticipatedly participated. And does this appear in Maximus? Does he use this? Does he make some note of this? This is what's used for the henads, the energies, et cetera. So how are these two thinkers making use of the Neoplatonic sources? Are they doing it in different ways? Huge question, but particularly on participation in that sense is what I'm interested in with the yeah. henads. I don't have your advantage of having an iPhone on me. Uh, so I can't really check as quickly. Um, I don't recall that particular expression being present in Maximus at all. Um, the expression that you get from Dionysus is about, un, uh, about participating in an, unparticip in, in an unparticipated manner. Is that language? Yeah, I don't remember that at all in Maximus. I don't think it occurs. Um, but the overall pattern of a, a threefold pattern that I try to outline from Proclus uh, entering into Maximus, um, you find that back in Dionysius' thinking. So the terminology is likely different. I would have to trace exactly what it is. It likely is somewhat different, um, but the pattern overall is not that dissimilar. Best I can do for now, sorry. Thank you very much for a very beautiful, substantial, useful lecture. I'd like to... Uh, to try to uh, get an answer with, uh, with a more, uh, let's say, broad pastoral import. He said that modernity separates creator from creation and 
has difficulty with an embodied God. I wonder if perhaps modern Christianity is just as most does not doing exactly the same thing, which is why it might have trouble with the notion of incarnation as being the pattern for creation. As being the one? The pattern for creation and creation pointing towards the incarnation um, and the incarnation being unrelated to the fall, but related to the act of very creation. That seems strangely perfectly traditional because it is, not only in Irenaeus and Maximus, but I think most Christians, most devout Christians, uh, would find it odd. Among the Orthodox, it's perhaps a bit different, but uh, generally speaking, it seems that if we combat modernity with a kind of Christianity that does the same kind of distinctions and has the same trouble with Maximus, then we're getting nowhere. So what's your recipe? Um, yeah, I, a big part of my response would have to simply echo your question. Um, I think you're exactly right, um, which is why I felt the need to exposit this at some length. And now I do think that Orthodoxy is generally in a somewhat better position than Western theology, generally speaking. Um, one of the issues that you mentioned about um, the reason for the incarnation, um, on that particular point, East and West, not always, but often, as you know, diverge. Uh, the West taking its cue from at least one line in Thomas Aquinas, uh, where, where the reason for the incarnation is sin. And, and I think that's the line that the West has generally chosen. Um, that's not the only reason for the divide uh, between heaven and earth, and not the only reason why, why um, we often avoid the language of embodiment in creation, but it is a reason for it, which is why I think the West is, a, is in a somewhat disadvantageous position. Um, that said, um, I think the impact of modernity is felt the world over. Um, you don't have to be in, in um, North America or in the West generally to sense the impact of modernity. Um, whether you're in Africa or in Asia or in, um, in, in Western Europe, we all carry our iPhones on it, on, on ourselves and with ourselves and we look on it every moment of the day. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you are. Um, and in our daily lives, therefore, also as Christians, um, we tend to think of, of the created order and of our lives within it as autonomous, separate from God. Um, one of the pastoral outcomes of, yeah, one of the theological, first of all, outcomes of that is that um, we've pushed God out of the picture, as it were. Um, and any sort of hint that we truly participate in the being of God is quickly considered pantheism, some form of pantheism. Um, we have often our theological rationales for that. We may, for example, say that, well, isn't it true that we only participate in common being, a created, created entity? Um, and to my mind, at least, such a theological solution is, is, is a way of ensconcing the creator creature separation, unhelpful. Um, and we need to go back, I think, to the early consensus of East and West, uh, where such a separation simply wasn't made and where such participation in common being simply was never asserted. It's always in the earlier tradition, East and West, participation in the being and in the life of God. You read St. Augustine, it's no different on that score from reading St. Maximus. Um, Yet whenever, not whenever, but often when I articulate these kinds of notions, um, that the, the, the fear is pretty much palpable in terms of where are, we, where are you taking me? And I, I like to immediately assure people I'm not taking you anywhere that's not orthodox and any small, anywhere that's not orthodox. This is the tradition of the church. Um, I simply want to be faithful to the tradition. And of course, as, as, I, as I articulated at the end of the, of the talk, there's a danger 
There always is. You can always fall off the wagon on either side. There is the danger that um, you would pantheize or anthropomorphize God, absolutely, and especially the, the former. It's always a danger. Um, but as long as we recognize that as creatures, we've been created ex nihilo um, with our own distinct essences by God. Um, we don't need to fear speaking about receiving, uh, receiving a participation in the being of God. Um, pastorally speaking, you started your question with, with the pastoral consideration. Pastorally speaking, uh, it seems to me hugely important um, because what a separation between creator and creature does is it alienates human beings from God and from themselves. Um, and it makes us fearful, anxious, alone in the world. Um, when you have a Chalcedonian slash Neoplatonic metaphysic, um, you're intimately related to God and intimately related to one another and to the entire cre uh, creation that God has made. It makes us feel at home, where we belong. Um, so I think there's pastorally uh, important mm -hmm. reasons also not to give up on this theological truth, yes. We have uh, a couple of questions that have come in online, so I'll ask Father Anthony to present the two questions and that'll conclude the Q&A time. The first one is from Casey Kimball says, thank you, Hans. Some take Maximus's Logi theology, incarnation anyway, anyway, and Proclean sympathies, and other things, all to say that creation is not just fitting or inevitable, but necessary for God. Do you think this is a correct reading of Maximus? Do you think it's true? Now, thank you, Casey, for the question. Casey is a former student of mine, is a PhD student now at Boston College. <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Casey. Um, it depends what you mean with the term necessity, I suppose. Um, the only time that I used the term necessity in the talk was to deny the God uh, created by way of necessity. And I did that on purpose in that context to, to make clear that, that God is free and um, that he is, is no, not under any external obligation uh, or compulsion to, to create. Um, and I think that's not unique to the Christian faith, actually. That's true also in Plotinus. There is no external obligation or force upon God, even in Plotinus. But certainly for the Christian, there cannot be, I would say. God is free, and our freedom is a participation in divine freedom, as Moshe makes clear time and again. So um, that said, um, if you wanted to talk about um, God creating necessarily, and you meant by that, that God creates uh, and quote unquote must create because that is his character. Um, so that God always acts um, conveniently or fittingly in line with his character and cannot but, um, then I would affirm that. I think we should, we should avoid a, a, a multiple possible worlds scenario where God has all these possibilities floating around and God says, well, let me pick X for the world uh, so as to protect God's freedom for, and, and to protect him against necessity. No, I, I, I would say in that sense, um, God must act because God is not outside, acting outside of his character ever. Uh, just no external obligation. Second question is from Reverend Adam Carnell. French phenomenologist Michel Henri made the same point about dehumanization following desacralization. Do you see any other points of contact between Henri and Maximus, and therefore between modern French theological phenomenology and Maximian metaphysics? I wish I could answer that question. That would be really nice, um, because then I would know a lot more about Michel Henri than I do. Um, and I cannot honestly uh, answer the question well. Um, I borrowed that language from Philip Sherard, um, who has a book under a similar title, and uh, I did not borrow it from French phenomenology, so I'm, I'm afraid I cannot really help your, your questioner.
So I'd ask our academic dean, Dr. Alex Chidoria, to come forward for the conferring of the degrees. Thank you, Father Chad. Thank you, Father Hans, uh, for this fresh reading of St. Maximus. It was really a, 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 an extraordinary moment to hear you tonight and to have you with us. Uh, particularly, this was crafted on a, such a very short notice, and I thank you personally very, very much. Uh, our event tonight has also an official part, and it is called a mid-year commencement. And uh, I know two of our graduates that are very anxious to come up here to get their degrees. So therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in the Board of Trustees and the Faculty of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary, by the Board of Regents of the University of the State of New York, the degree of Master of Arts is conferred upon Mr. William Rusk. By virtue of the authority vested in the Board of Trustees and the Faculty of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary, by the Board of Regents of the University of the State of New York, the degree of Doctor of Ministry is conferred upon Reverend Elias Dorham. As it is customary for our Doctor of Ministry graduates, I will invite now Father Elias to share with us his remarks. Good evening. I stand here tonight thankful to God and to all those who have encouraged me, prayed for me, and supported me during the course of my Doctor of Ministry studies. In particular, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude to my beloved wife, Tahuria Silvia, and our children for their ongoing love, support, patience, and prayers as I work my way through my studies. I'm also grateful to the faculty of the DMIN program, and in particular, to my final project advisor, Father Nicholas Solak, and to my second reader, Father Sergius Halverson, who served, uh, who from the very first day of the program, has been a tremendous mentor and source of encouragement to me. Participating in the Doctor of Ministry program has been a life-changing experience. A few aspects of the program that stand out are world-class academic instruction in the Orthodox Christian faith, the focus on effective pastoral application of our learning, the experiential components of the on-site intensives, and the close friendships and professional relationships fostered by participating as a cohort. Perhaps the most impactful aspect of the program was the final project. As a married man, I'm personally invested in how marriage has suffered from what Father Alexander identifies as the fateful divorce between theology, liturgy, and piety. And based on encounters with married couples in my parish ministry, my demon final project research was in the area of the Orthodox Christian pastoral vision of marriage as mutual martyrdom and mutual sanctification. In keeping with Father Alexander's conception of theology as a way of seeing the world, the goal of my project was to help couples learn to understand the challenges in their marriage as opportunities to encounter Christ. This culmination of my demon academic experience was transformative for myself and for the many couples from my parish who participated. And because of this work, the primary focus of my ministry has become helping others to see their daily challenges and struggles through the lens of liturgy and theology. This can be a way to experience God in the most unexpected moments for the sake of one's ongoing transformation in Christ, <clears throat> and as a practical outcome of learning to reintegrate liturgy, theology, and piety in the context of marriage. Vladika, Daniel, Father Chad, Dr. Tadori, and all the distinguished members of the Seminary Board of Trustees, thank you for the gift of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary and for the good work that is done here to equip and train current and future ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
May the work that is done here bear fruit a hundredfold, and may God grant you all many years. Lady Daniel comes up to offer us some closing remarks, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, there is a really lovely reception that's down in the lower level of this building for all of us to participate in. We do have, of course, the mandatory photographs. Uh, so I'd ask uh, the two reserve rows, the, the, the faculty, uh, to stay behind uh, for the photographs. We'll get the photographs done as quickly as possible. But the rest of you, uh, after we've had the closing prayer, Kaparian of uh, the three hierarchs whose feast we are keeping this day, the rest of you just move downstairs. And I know a lot of you will want to queue up and, and ask uh, Professor Burzma some questions, but wait downstairs at the reception and we'll give you free access to him. Ladika Daniel. His Beatitude Metropolitan Tikhon, who is the chairman of the board of St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary, has asked that I convey his greetings to all of you and his blessing as well, uh, and special greetings and welcome to His Eminence Metropolitan Antonios, who's with us here this evening. His gratitude as well to Dr. Borsma uh, for his willingness to give this annual lecture in memory of Father Alexander Schmemann, as well as his congratulations to the two graduates. We began this morning by celebrating the divine liturgy on this wonderful feast of the three holy hierarchs, the theologians, the great ecumenical teachers, our fathers in the faith, and we've ended the day with this academic service of commencement and the exceptional lecture given by Dr. Borsma. And in between this morning and the celebration of the Divine Liturgy and this evening with this academic exercise, much has been taking place on this property here at St. Vladimir Seminary. You've gone about your daily lives, academic pursuits, family life, service. And for me, observing that today throughout the day, it is very much uh, an image of what this seminary is all about, rooted in the faith. The chapel, of course, is the very heart of the seminary. And the daily activities that take place here are intended to prepare you for service in the church, whether it be ordained ministry or some other type of ministry or service. That's what this place, uh, this history, this legacy of St. Vladimir's is all about. And the church rejoices, the entire church rejoices in the legacy that is the legacy of St. Vladimir's, but also in its future and its future role in providing servants in the image of Christ to his church. Thank you.